Welcome to the Futurati Podcast. Any member of the Futurati is somebody who believes in the power of the future. We know there's a better world ahead, and we indeed have the power to make it so. In our podcast, we talk to the best minds in the world about the most urgent problems facing mankind today, and we hope you learn as much from them as we do. I'm Thomas Fry, a professional futurist and keynote speaker. And I'm Trent Fowler, a machine learning engineer and author. Thank you for joining us. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Futurati Podcast. Tonight, we're joined by Corey Hofstein. Corey is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Newfound is a quantitative asset management firm seeking to help investors proactively navigate the risks of investing through better diversification. If you enjoyed this interview, please don't forget to like the episode and subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our website, futuratipodcast.com. Corey, thanks so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Let's hear a little bit about your background, your interests, and what brought you to the space you're in today. Sure. So my background, I'll start, I guess, academic background. Undergraduate was in computer science. I always thought I would be a video game programmer. Taught myself to program when I was like 12. That was my passion. In high school, I programmed games for my Game Boy. Nice. I wrote 3D game engines. Got to college, realized I absolutely wanted nothing to do with that industry. Made a quick pivot into <laughs> finance. Um, this was like 2005, 2006. All of my friends were going into investment banking. I sort of fell in love with this idea of applying computer science and investing together. Didn't know it was a whole field called quant finance at the time, but that's what I sort of discovered. And then ended up going to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon for their computational finance degree which was uh, and is a financial engineering program uh, designed at the time more focused on derivatives pricing. A lot of the career track was to go to the big Wall Street banks and go work on a derivatives sales and trading desk. The timing was pretty poor there because I entered that in 2009. And by the time I left, the entire sort of Wall Street bank uh, program had been dismantled. Unfortunately, you weren't trading credit default swaps and that sort of stuff right. anymore. But I was fortunate enough that I had started this firm called Newfound Research. I just sort of stumbled into it, uh, licensing some research from quantitative models I had built. And I decided that it was sort of uh, the best time. It was cash flow positive for me to try something entrepreneurial. My father was an entrepreneur. I always knew I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. Figured, give it a stab while I'm young. And if it doesn't work out, I can always go back and work somewhere else. And I guess, uh, you know, 14 years later since I started it, something like that, uh, 13 years, still still here, still doing it. So we've evolved quite a bit uh, to keep this as brief as possible. We originally started as a research firm about five or six years into the firm history. We decided to transition into a more traditional asset management structure. So we run mutual funds. We provide indices for ETFs. We run model portfolios on different uh, model manager platforms. Our whole core thesis is really about trying to help investors proactively navigate market risks. And we believe that the best way to do that is via diversification. But we think investors need to think about diversification much more holistically than just what they invest in, but also how they're making those investment decisions and even when they're making those investment decisions. And so that concept really is the core of what we're looking to do. So, so how much do you think the, the cryptocurrency world will affect what you're doing over the next 10 years? And, and are you working with that currently? So for someone who was in computer science, I probably have been far too dismissive of cryptocurrency, candidly. I, I dabbled way back in the day. I definitely have a Bitcoin wallet that I've lost on some laptop that's in a landfill somewhere, never to be recovered. But I really just sort of paid attention peripherally because I was so caught up in my own career and building my own business until earlier this year, where I said to dismiss something because I don't understand it is not an open minded view. I'm becoming more closed minded as I get older. And, you know, we probably do that to optimize towards our own wisdom, but at the risk of missing big, big phase shifts in the world. And so I started getting uh, more actively involved in crypto, uh, trading a lot of traditional finance strategies on crypto exchanges, and then starting to mess around with decentralized finance, more recently playing a lot with NFTs. 
And I, I don't think crypto's going away. I don't know where it's going, but I don't think it's going away. I can't find an example in the history of mankind where so much brain power has been put into an industry to ultimately have nothing come out of it. Right. Do I know what that something is going to be? No, I'm not smart enough. I haven't spent enough time in it. But to me, I have to keep my pulse, my, you know, my finger on the pulse to it to a certain degree, because I think it will change the way things work over the next decade or two. What, what have you uh, explored with respect to NFTs? And I asked because we just published an episode with Joel Kahn, who has uh, he has two podcasts, both of them related to crypto, and he's sort of a crypto evangelist of some renowned. And so it's one of those things that just kind of kept coming up, and I kept thinking, I'm going to have to get into this eventually. Um, but I could just sense that it's an entire intricate world that I just didn't have the mental bandwidth to to explore at the moment. So I'm curious as to what your own explorations have yielded. So I started looking back probably January, February, maybe a little even after that top shots was really big. Um, and it seemed more like a bubble at that point that, that died down into the summer. So I sort of ignored the concept. I, I took a look into, you know, how is a non fungible token truly different than a fungible token? And what are some of the interesting things that people are trying to do with it, but they didn't seem to be getting a ton of traction. And then in August, non fungible tokens really took off. And so just coming from more of an investing and trading background, my first inclination was, okay, how can I make money from this? Right. So I started flipping NFTs and looking at the trading patterns. And one of the things that you find as you start to get involved in this world is there's certainly some like true believers in these NFT projects and these NFT projects to really figure out what's going on, you have to join their communities. And so there are some that I truly just believe are for lack of a better word, pump and dump schemes. People are in it only for financial gain and speculation. And then there's other projects that have evolved over time to develop roadmaps that are either uh, involved in the physical space. So someone like a Gary V, Gary right. Vaynerchuk has his V friends. And I believe if you own one of his NFTs, it entitles you access to his conferences, right? So it's sort of a digital ticket. You can prove you own it. Um, and you get all these real world experiences out of it. So that's where sort of the value comes from. There's others that have more of a digital value to them. So there was a game that I played midsummer called Zed's Run. That was a digital horse racing and breeding game. And your NFT was your horse and you could breed it with other horses to create new NFTs and you could race them and win cash prizes. So that's a whole other avenue gaming uh, where these NFTs can be valuable. And then there's just other ways in which I think for me as a, like I consider myself a middle millennial, I'm right on the cusp of this digital identity that I think is really important to younger millennials and, and Gen Z where they spend so much time online and in a digital space that avatar and digital identity is really important to them. And so there's just these vanilla profile picture projects that if they become meaningful enough show in group, you know, inclusivity that they identify as a board ape or a crypto punk. And it says something both about, you know, who they are as a person, what they value and their net worth. It's like a digital Rolex in many ways. And so you see someone like a Twitter now saying that they're going to show on a Twitter profile, whether a profile picture is an authenticated NFT. And now all of a sudden you have social value to these as well, uh, which I think is where you really start to see runaway valuations. You look at some of the most expensive items in the world and they're luxury goods that really are hard to justify for anything other than social value. Right, for, for status, yeah. That's an in interesting economic phenomenon. And I hadn't really given much thought to the the, the role that NFTs will play in the increasing uh, digitization of identity, I guess, as more and more of, of who we are and, and who we think of ourselves as being moves online. NFTs are, are an important mechanism, an important medium uh, for that transition to occur. That, that's very interesting. Thomas, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, some of the thinking is there's going to be lots of utilitarian value for NFTs and that our driver's license and passport in the future will be an NFT and our title for our house will be an NFT. Um, 
I personally, I like this idea of having an empty pockets lifestyle so that I don't have to carry crap around with me and, and forget it in the process. So that, that, that seems like that would be uh, hugely advantageous. So I, I, I like uh, some of the ideas surrounding this, but um, so far we've just seen a lot of this associated with the gaming world and not too much uh, practical use so far. Uh, I think that transition somewhere in the future because um, it, it, it just doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense that we're just going to all be playing games all day long, so. <laughs> well, I think almost any great technology can be traced back to either an entertainment purpose right. or a uh, war-related purpose, right? So, you know, perhaps or, it's or the inter- Well, yeah. I, I'm throwing that in entertainment, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, but, but you sort of say, okay, if it takes that initial traction of gaming to get, create that saturation and get more people used to dealing with NFTs, so that we can eventually have an NFT passport, an NFT driver's license. In my own industry and in finance, the know your customer process can be quite onerous if everyone sort of had a digital verification that allowed me to say, oh, you truly are an accredited investor. And I can just look at the NFT as proof that it's been given by some sort of authoritative uh, government body or whatever it is, you know, that streamlines a huge part of the industry. So I think there's going to be massive implications for the utilitarian side as well, of course. Yeah. I, I think yeah. you see a similar dynamic at play when like really wealthy people get into a space and there, there's not really much validation for it. Nobody even knows that this is going to be anything, but they're luxury goods, they're status goods, or it's just, you know, a billionaire scratching an itch. They've always really liked this. And I think you're starting to see some of that in the nascent space race between Blue Origin, SpaceX, Virgin Galactic. These are just, you know, nerds that made it big that always dreamed of, you know, going to the stars. Now they're kind of doing that and they're paving the way, building these industries out, the infrastructure, the public buy-in, what have you. And as a result, hopefully over time, that will become more and more affordable as there's economies of scale, as people figure out more effective processes for creating the rockets, for getting them up, for getting them down, for transporting things around uh, and solving some of those initial problems that always come with this. Uh, I'm curious as to with NFTs and trading them, like what that process looked like, Uh, because I've heard of people flipping NFTs, but I have no idea where you would go, how you would do that, what the research looks like. So NFTs sort of come to life uh, in two ways. They get minted initially, and that's early days, like when, when an NFT is minted via a smart contract. Normally what happens is someone interacts with a smart contract, pays the gas fees, and in exchange, and maybe a, a fee for the art, and in exchange, they re- receive the NFT. Early August, you could do that as a human being, you could find these projects and be early on. At this point, it's become so hyper competitive that you get what are getting called gas wars, that uh, there's so many people trying to do it at the same time, the cost of a transaction goes up exponentially, and it becomes really prohibitively expensive to try to do it by hand. You have a ton of very sophisticated programmers who are now trying to, you know, quote unquote, bought this process where they're writing automated scripts, they're sending money to dozens, if not hundreds of different wallets, and they're automating the whole minting process. And so trying to compete with that, unless you really want to go down that rabbit hole programmatically, is probably too hard for someone who's just dabbling at this point. But then what happens is you get this whole secondary market effect. So once they get minted, Everyone goes over, the primary market is OpenSea.io is the website, and that's where the major secondary market is, and all of these things start trading. And there's now a large number of tools you can use to try to figure out what is the value of these things, um, who's accumulating them, what are the different traits of these NFTs that I'm looking at in comparison to the rest of the project? Is it possible to identify one that's perhaps mispriced relative to the rest of the project based on its different traits? And not surprisingly, as those tools have become more and more available, the market has become more and more efficient in sorting those things out faster. In fact, uh, a lot of these NFTs have a post sort of mint reveal 
where they mint and then it takes 24, 48 hours for the actual image and metadata to show up. But tools are getting so fast that they can figure out what's actually behind the uh, unrevealed image and are starting to price before you can even tell what's on there in OpenSea. So there's some really sophisticated actors playing in this space. It's gotten incredibly competitive over the last two and a half months. I would say most of like what I dabble in, which is just trading for fun, is based on trying to find projects that are um, underappreciated and likely are going to have some social momentum behind them. So being in a lot of Discord servers or knowing a lot of um, players in the who are popular Twitter influencers, tracking their wallets, trying to figure out what they're buying and jumping in if the price is low enough and I think it has enough room to run. So this, this actually opens the door for lots of untapped revenue streams for musicians and for, yep. uh, for artists. And so they're, they're looking at this as uh, uh, kind of a whole new uh, revenue stream that uh, they never imagined would ever exist. And so that's caught a lot of, a, a lot of people's attention in that space. There was a wonderful story of a young woman who was an artist who wasn't having a tremendous amount of success. She created this project called Cup Cats, I think it was. And one of the unique attributes to an NFT is because everything is trackable and all transactions are trackable, that whenever there is a transaction, part of the transaction cost can actually go back to the original artist. So the original artist can say, I in perpetuity want to earn a two and a half percent fee of any sale. Right. So think of think of the number of artists we know who died penniless and then their work went on to be worth untold fortunes and their estate right. never really earned any of that. Right. The way these smart contracts are written are these NFTs in perpetuity for any given sale will go back. And so this young woman created, I think it was a hundred unique cup cats, is what she called them. They were like cats in cupcakes. And there was this weird social phenomenon where everyone heard her story. And these really big crypto influencers started buying them. And an individual ones started going up to like 10 ETH each. So for those who don't know what ETH is trading at, I think today it's around $3,900. So that's like 39,000. This might've been a month ago. So it's closer to 30,000 for a picture of a cup cat. Uh, again, a cupcake with cat in it, I guess. <laughs> just right? a cute and, image, right? That's unique. Yeah. Right. And it yeah. wasn't just the mint price. She was then able to, for all the transactions that were happening, all the buys and sells, she was able to get a cut of that market. And so that was uh, transformative in her life, right? And I think that's a hugely powerful tool for artists to be able to guarantee that whenever their art takes off, they're able to continue to participate. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. So the NFTs are, it's the three O's. It's proof of originality, proof of ownership, and um, uh, a proof of origin. I, I think that's, I think I got that right. <laughs> and, and so, uh, but for most people, I mean, it's still too geeky for most people that we don't, we don't have good interfaces. We don't have we're, we're not training people going through grade school and high school about these things. And so it's such a new phenomenon that it, it scares a lot of people at the moment. Um, so as we're, we're seeing transitions like this, um, we're seeing people that are kind of shifting away from the old finance world, from the old banking world, from the old ways of making money. And, um, and as I, as I look at the number of banks and branch banks all around, all around the country, all around the world, um, how much longer can banks keep investing in all this real estate? Do you have any sense of that? I, I don't have any sense of it, but it is a fantastic question. Anyone who has spent any time in playing with decentralized finance, so these smart contracts that are written that try to replicate what traditional finance is doing, but doing it on the blockchain realizes how onerous the barriers to entry are in traditional finance really are and potentially how unnecessary they are. So just as an example, <clears throat> I can onboard, you know, my fiat currency onto Coinbase. I can buy some 
Bitcoin, and then I can take that Bitcoin and I can go to a protocol like Aave. Now, Aave is a borrowing and lending protocol. So I can take my Bitcoin and I can uh, use it as collateral at Aave to instantaneously borrow against it. There's no banker in the middle asking me how much my Bitcoin is worth because it's all provable. I have the Bitcoin. It's in my wallet. You can check the blockchain to ensure it's there. And then they have smart contracts that tell me up to how much I can borrow based on how much collateral I post. And then if my loan to value ratio ever goes beyond a certain point, they auto liquidate me uh, and take my collateral away because I posted it at Aave. And once you do that, you realize it was so incredibly cheap and efficient, and you can do it any time of day, and you never have to deal with a banker or paperwork. And you start to look around and say, why do we have all this red tape in traditional finance? Not to say it's, it's bad and we should get rid of regulations and, and people in the middle, but you go, why can't this be done with a mortgage? Is this the optimal or a car amount? loan? Right. Like, have we have we gone too far in the amount of red tape just because that's the way it was done 100 years ago? And when you start to see it all replicated in a very sort of laissez-faire way, you go, oh, this alternative path that's now enabled by blockchain technology is pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, there, there are a couple of interesting connections here. So on the one hand, we discussed earlier how there are certain luxury goods like original Monet's, for example. So anybody can Google any of the p paintings that Monet produced in his lifetime, but there's just something valuable about having the original, the one that is actually the product of the man's your hands and his, and his paintbrush. Uh, and, and I think that's a useful analogy for understanding some of the intrinsic value of NFTs. But on the other hand, um, Chris Dixon, who runs a, uh, a 16 Z or a, a Z, I forget how, how to say that. Yeah. Is it a 16 Z? Yeah. And Andreessen Horowitz that they're, uh, he, he runs their crypto investments. He's argued that actually NFTs and some of these other technologies are unique digital primitives. So we sort of analogize them to original artworks and other things, but they have unique properties and affordances, which enable them to be used in ways that are very, uh, unintuitive and, um, just sort of ripe for exploring green fields. And given that you are in finance, you've been looking at decentralized finance, you've been looking specifically at NFTs. Do you think there's any just really interesting applications of these technologies? Is anybody using them in ways that are totally unique and, and no one would, would foresee if they didn't have that unique confluence of interest that you have? I think digital primitives are a great way to put this. And, and it's something you've seen in traditional, uh, in, in decentralized finance as well, is that decentralized finance is really built up from all these composable sort of money Lego building blocks, right? You can take these ideas that are very, very simple primitives like borrowing and lending and keep building on top of them because it's all just a smart contract that exists on the blockchain that's just an executing program, right? So when we say smart contract for anyone to whom this sounds like, what are they talking about? It's just a computer program, right? It's a fancy way of just saying there's a computer program and you can just think of it as a recipe that's always gonna run the same way. And so when you build a smart contract that allows someone to borrow and lend, well, then someone else can build all sorts of things on top of that. So NFTs are in and of themselves a very primitive technology. To date, we've used them in a way that says, hey, I'm buying some metadata. That metadata points to an image somewhere, hopefully hosted in a non-centralized fashion. Uh, it's going to might have some other traits. And that's been attractive to us because we've been supporting different types of art or avatar projects. But there are other projects that are popping up where it's less about what the actual art is and what's the data behind it and what an audience might be able to do with it. So one NFT that got really, really popular was called Loot for Adventurers. And it was just a black background with white text. And the white text was you know, different types of armor or swords or magic wands. And it was all sort of randomized and created And each loot bag gave you whatever the loot was. And there was nothing else to it, right? There was no game that went along with it. There was nothing else to it. <laughs> and these things went up to be worth, again, 30,000 to $100,000 if you had a very rare loot bag. And you might say, why would someone pay $100,000 for a black background and white text? And a lot of the argument there was 
around the audience is going to use this as a primitive for all sorts of games. And what you saw very rapidly in the week after is if you were a holder of one of these loot bags, you could then, you were entitled to then go mint a realm. So all of a sudden you owned land and you were entitled to go mint some gold. And then they were literally on the fly building a game and using it as your entry to the game, both in, in, in the metadata that you could use, but then all sorts of ways in which these different NFTs were coming out could be composed together. And I don't think it ever really took off the way people expected it to. There's probably a little bit of, you know, price got ahead of where the real traction of the project was, but you start to see people think of this not as it's done, right? The project isn't done when it's minted. It's, this is now an entry pass. This is now something that's composable. I can take one NFT with another and marry them together in some way to create a third NFT. And that sort of composability, I think, really opens up a very wide world of unique possibilities, right? And things that I, again, I, I don't make NFTs. I just sort of have dabbled in trading them. I don't profess to be smart enough or creative enough to know where this is going. But I do know when you give people, you know, uh, red, blue, and green, you can get a whole rainbow and a, and a spectrum out of it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So there was a recent uh, article that came out and they talked about how they incorporated AI into one NFT and they incorporated AI into another NFT and they had uh, a convert conversation between the two NFTs on their own. Um, so that's that's opening the door to all kinds of new possibilities that nobody ever considered in the past. Um, but as, as these things start transitioning and start evolving, um, we, we had this conversation uh, a week ago about the idea that uh, how many identities should we be able to have in the online world? And um, should we be limited to one uh, identity and um, one avatar, um, like if you ever played Second Life, people would have multiple avatars and they would cause all kinds of chaos. Um, is it, Have you given any thought to anything like that? You know, it's not something I've given thought to. It's a very interesting question. Again, as, as I consider myself this middle millennial, I, I grew up with video games and I was in that early cusp of massive multiplayer online games. And that digital avatar was important, right? It was, uh, you built reputation in these online communities, the same way people build reputation, even if they're anonymous Twitter users. Uh, one of the things I've noticed, particularly in the crypto space, is that some of the m largest influencers are completely anonymous. There's a cat in a hazmat suit. Uh, there's a there's a guy who looks like a penguin and, and there's a guy who looks like a blueberry. And they're some of the most influential people in, in crypto. Um, and those are the avatars and personalities that they've selected. I guess if, if you were to press me, I would say I think it's a real luxury to be able to have multiple identities and be able to hit the reset button. Um, to carry around a sole identity with you on every digital interaction forces you to think about the relationships that you're building, right? And yeah. and perhaps your reputation follows you around, uh, but also takes away any opportunity that and benefit that you would want from anonymity at certain points. Yeah, right? um, over the weekend, uh, I was in Chicago and I was, um, my son took me to a Banksy uh, museum exhibit. Uh, and there's this real interesting quote that Banksy made, and he said, nobody ever paid attention to me, to me until they didn't know who I was. <laughs> and I, I always find that to be <laughs> such a fascinating phenomenon. Um, I think that's probably true, right? If, if everyone, if Banksy was suddenly revealed, would the art be worth as much as it is? Right. I don't think so. I don't I, I, well, it's the same. Would would Bitcoin be worth as much if people actually knew who Satoshi Nakamoto was? Right. 
Yeah. Um, so, like, what are you purchasing when you, you buy Banksy or you buy Bitcoin or you buy Banksy coin? You know, it's part of it is just the, the mystery of it all and kind of the the mystique and the almost like legendary founding story of Bitcoin, where this one man, you know, or probably a small group of people put this technology out there and then disappeared. You know, and he's got to be a billionaire. Nobody knows who he is. It's just it's a story you couldn't make up. It's incredible. Yeah. So never underestimate the power of novelty. Yeah. Um, or mystery. Yeah. Mystery. <laughs> That's why I've been using a fake name on this podcast from day one. <laughs> All right. So no. should we should we talk about newfound research a little bit? Sure. Let's dive into it. Yeah. Let's uh, let's pivot over to liquidity cascades. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you sent some really interesting papers over um, that gave me a nosebleed as I was reading them, but I, I soldiered on. I wanted to start with liquidity cascades, uh, the coordinated risk of uncoordinated market participants, because it's it struck me that there would be some fertile territory there to explore with respect to how complex behavior emerges out of relatively simple interactions. And uh, there might be some game theory lenses that you could apply to this. So I wanted to start by just motivating the question. Uh, so the paper is attempting to to answer something, right? It's, it's attempting to probe a phenomenon, right? And in the introduction, you note that large and sudden drawdowns uh, are a known risk feature for market historians. And you say that one would hope that as markets mature, volatility occurring from endogenous events would diminish. But uh, it's not obvious to me that that would be the case. Like, why would we expect as markets mature for these large drawdowns or these endogenous shocks to, to go down? Why would you expect the system to become less fragile to those? Yeah, so let's first sort of separate what we mean by an exogenous shock to the market versus an endogenous one. So an exogenous shock would be a scenario where markets are repriced because of something external to the markets themselves. There is a true economic phenomenon that is occurring that is causing people to, in theory, rationally reprice future cash flow and therefore shares are being devalued, right? And so an example would just be there's an economic recession. An endogenous event is that markets are selling off, and it's not always has to be a sell-off, but most people care about a sell-off, uh, because of market structure itself. So actually, crypto is a great segue here, because after publishing this paper, I started to again, talk to more people in the crypto space, and they've been talking about liquidation cascades for years. One of the phenomenon in the, the world of crypto that people will notice is that there are very violent crashes that tend to occur from time to time. We just had one this May where most of the major uh, coins lost 50, 60, 70% in the span of a week, most of which came over two nights. And the question is, why does that occur? Uh, is it just that the asset is that naturally volatile? And the answer is, when you look at the data, that there is a tremendous amount of leverage that gets used on different cryptocurrency exchanges. So if I were to go to Binance or FTX or Kraken, I could put up a dollar and buy $10 of Bitcoin derivatives. Some, and some of them you used to be able to buy $100 worth. Right now, what happens if I buy a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin and it goes down one percent? Well, what's going to happen is the exchange is going to say, "Well, you only put up a dollar. You've already lost a dollar. We're liquidating your position." But I bought a hundred dollars of Bitcoin, so they need to liquidate the full one hundred. Okay. So what happens in these situations is when there's a large number of participants who are highly levered and the market sells off a little bit, it can trigger this cascade where the first person gets auto liquidated and the exchange needs to sell their holdings. And in selling their holdings, they actually drive the price down further, which triggers someone else's liquidation. And now you've got two people that need to be, right. their, their assets need to be sold, which drives the price down further and triggers this liquidation cascade. And so this is a phenomenon that's been happening in crypto for years and years because you have this huge amount of embedded leverage. It has nothing to do with people changing their view as to what the price should be. It's just simply that the people who were very bullish are now getting liquidated. And that liquidation is through the process of liquidation, driving price artificially down 
because you're taking out all the demand of all these people uh, before people can, can manage their risk appropriately. And so this is what I would consider to be an endogenous feature of those markets. Okay. So you're back to your question, why would we not expect that in more mature markets? Well, what we would hope is that in a mature, efficient market, changes in price shouldn't really have anything to do with market structure. Changes in price, we would hope, would only have to do with changes in fundamentals, right? We don't want a market where Coca-Cola is worth $100 and all of a sudden it's worth 50 because there was some sort of weird high frequency trading glitch, right? right. Or because um, all of a sudden S&P decided to take it out of their S&P 500 index and every S&P 500 tracking ETF in the world just arbitrarily sold Coca-Cola stock because it's no longer in the index. That really has nothing to do with whether Coca-Cola is the right price or not based on its future cash flow. We don't want those types of events actually impacting whether Coca-Cola price changes. Okay. And so it's, it's, you would hope that as time goes on, if the fundamentals are sound, that's just ref reflected in the price. Sort of a, this isn't exactly right, but sort of an application of the efficient market hypothesis. Like you would expect, people have had thirty years to look at this company. They know what the fundamentals are. There's no big surprises here. Then there should not be a market a market microstructure which would give rise to a liquidity cascade or a liquidation cascade. Do I have that right? Exactly that. We would hope that as markets become more efficient and more stable that we wouldn't have these endogenous events. And so for me, the big, the, where, this, where this paper really came from was sitting in March, 2020 and watching markets and saying there was a clear economic driver here. It was curious to me that it didn't kick in sooner, right? There was the, the COVID crisis that was clearly going to affect global economies. It came to the US late, but global equity markets were really delayed in their response, which was very odd to me. But then there was just a very violent sell-off. And in some ways, what we saw was the sell-off stopped being about market fundamentals. It stopped being about how is COVID going to affect future cash flow. And it moved into this realm of there was mechanical buying and selling rules in products like levered ETFs or bank hedging in structured products, or option dealer hedging in their underlying option positions that was no longer related to fundamentals. It was just money chasing money and moving the market in very violent directions. And again, that's purely endogenous. And so the question is, how is it 2021? And we're having massive market meltdowns that are still not connected to true fundamentals, but they're being really driven by these endogenous market factors. So one of one of the the things that was never looked at in the past when a when a company was was having problems is this idea of of employees quitting in mass. Um, the, we have this thing called the Great Resignation going on right now, and we. And we have a lot of people guessing at what's causing it, but we don't really seem to have any good st solid statistics on it. And, um, and so this becomes a new factor that investors suddenly have to pay attention to that didn't exist in the past. Can you, can you talk to that a little bit? So I, can, I can't talk specifically to that phenomenon because it is new and it is emergent, but perhaps I can draw a parallel which had to do a lot with this sort of companies and employee retention. And, and what, what you see in tech companies is that they pay their employees very heavily in stock and stock options. And so while the company is doing well and the stock price is sort of going up, whether it's private or public, you tend to see higher retention. But once, if they go public and the stock price starts to do poorly and a huge amount of employee compensation is in stock, you can get more employee turnover, which can make the company do worse. And it enters into this negative spiral. And so there's interesting phenomena like that, that 
I think are more pronounced today, potentially, than they were 50 years ago, because the way the leading companies in our markets are compensating employees has fundamentally changed. And so it's not quite related to what you're saying with sort of this, you know, uh, what we're seeing with, with large amounts of people, this grand resignation that we're seeing. But I think it, it is, it does tie into how some of these effects can become pro-cyclical within the markets themselves. So you were, you were quoted in the Wall Street Journal uh, like yesterday, um, you were talking about this phenomenon called return stacking. Uh, can you can you explain what that is and how that works? Yeah, I will say it's always nice to be in the Wall Street Journal uh, and have it be positive rather than showing just having your name show up and have it be negative. <laughs> Listen, return stacking is so. I wrote this paper uh, with a peer of mine named Rodrigo Gorgillo and, and Adam Butler. Uh, at Resolve Asset Management. And return stacking is just a very pleasant way of talking about leverage. So leverage is a concept in the world of finance that people are typically averse to, which I find interesting because there's so many different types of leverage that people use in their life, right? When they borrow to go to school, they are using a form of leverage uh, to invest in their human capital. When they take a mortgage for a house, right? They're using leverage to buy real estate. If you have a credit card, it's in many ways leverage. Take a, take a bank loan for a car, it's, it's a type of leverage. And yet when we talk about investing, people really don't like the concept of borrowing money to invest. You know, again, despite the fact that every major corporation in the world does exactly that. Right. You look at the S&P 500 and you look at how much debt those companies take out to reinvest it's an active capital allocation decision that they make. And yet as investors, we don't want to do it. The problem that th we were trying to address with this idea of return stacking is that in the modern era, most investors tend to hold a portfolio that looks like a, what we would call a 60-40, 60% stocks, 40% bonds. And say what you will about the 60 and your views on whether markets are overvalued or not and what forward returns are going to be. I'm going to leave that alone. I've been saying markets are overvalued for the last six years and have been completely wrong. Equity markets are really hard to predict. Bond markets are not, right? If I tell you, you just bought a 10-year US Treasury with a 1.5% coupon yield, 10 years later, you're going to have a 1.5% return annually because you just got your coupon yield and then you got your principal back at the end, assuming the U.S. doesn't default, right? Right. right. right? But it's sort of gravity. Like the yield is your gravity there. And so when you look at the 60-40 today and say, wow, you got 40% of your portfolio in the Barclays aggregate that's maybe yielding two, two and a half percent nominally. And then after inflation, and if you pay an advisor, all of a sudden, that looks like a big negative number. Right. Well, not big, but negative. Right. Uh, that's a tough proposition. And so what we typically lean towards in our industry is saying, well, you should probably introduce some alternatives, some other diversifiers in your portfolio that have a better chance of return. They are, unfortunately, a little bit more expensive, um, but can potentially actually generate positive returns in this environment. The reality is most investors don't want to move off that 60-40 because it's been one of the best performing portfolios for the last decade, if not the last 20 years. Uh, and they don't, they certainly don't like expensive tax inefficient alternatives because in a low return environment, the two things you really have control over are taxes and cost of your investments. So what we proposed was basically saying, look, you can take a dollar, let's take a hundred dollars and put 60 of it in stocks and 40 of it in bonds, or, you could find some type of investment that's levered up, a 60-40 that's levered up 1.5 times. So when you give it a uh, $100, you're actually getting $90 of equity and $60 of bonds, right? So $150 of exposure. And now you don't need to invest all your money in that. You can invest two thirds of your money in that. So 1.5 times 0.66 or 66% gets you 100% exposure. So you can get, invest two thirds of your money in this levered product and maintain your 60-40 exposure. And then you've got 
basically a third of your money left over to do whatever you want. And you could invest in alternatives. You could invest in, you know, areas where you think you can find alpha or add incremental return. And in effect, what you're doing is freeing up that capital and stacking a new return stream on top of the 60-40 you already had. So return stacking is just repackaging in many ways. The original ideas of modern portfolio theory, which go back to the 1950s, which say, find a really well-diversified portfolio, lever it up to the risk profile you want. What we're saying is no one does that in practice. Everyone's too risk averse. But why don't you at least apply a little leverage so you can have your 60-40, free up some capital, and then with that freed up capital, you can invest in diversifying secondary return streams that can be additive in this low return environment. So, so what are those other sources of alpha that you've been looking at investing in? So one of the big questions that a lot of advisors have been asking us about is this inflation fear, right? So what do you right. do about inflation. I think the common answer for a lot of people has just been commodities. I don't particularly like blanket commodities. I don't think there's a good reason why you would expect commodities to have a positive risk premium. In other words, I don't expect commodities to appreciate in value. They might go up during an inflationary scare, but if I buy you know, an ounce of gold today, I don't expect it to appreciate maybe beyond inflation uh, over the next hundred years, the way I would expect a company that can reinvest in growth to potentially appreciate in cash flow. So what I've been talking to a lot of people about is saying, look, you want your 60, 40, and then what you want to stack on top is probably some sort of diversifier, both in the type of economic risks you have. So 60-40 does not do well in a recession, does not do well in an inflationary environment, and is also not going to potentially lead to massive drawdowns, right? You don't want to like double up on stocks, for example. So we've been talking a lot uh, with investors about allocating to things like managed futures. Um, and so for anyone who's listening who's not familiar with managed futures, these are investment programs that go back to like the 1970s where uh, Managers are investing in commodity markets, currency markets, equity markets, and fixed income markets using a derivative contract known as futures. And so they're able to go long and short, mostly based on this idea of trend following. And it's historically proven to be a great inflation hedge. And we've also talked about investing in global macro strategies that have the ability to go long and short and typically do well. Uh, and can do well during inflationary periods. And so the whole idea is to find some sort of like structurally unique return stream that is going to be different than the 60-40, not only in the economic sensitivities it has, but the type of payoff profiles it can create as well. So so your best guess is how long before um, I could take my Bitcoin wallet and go to the bank and deposit it into my bank account there? That's a great question. There's got to be very uh, forward thinking banks that will have that done in the next five Did, years. Like Silicon Valley Bank, I would imagine in five years will allow you to do that. Yeah, that's a good one. I, that one had so, occurred. So, to me. is there some possible prerequisite, something that has to happen first before that can happen? Anything that comes to mind? Well, I think the big concern from a regulatory perspective is, again, probably knowing about the origin right the uh of that bitcoin right from a money laundering right, perspective exactly. and so i'm not like i'm not hyper tied into the regulation requirements there but i would presume that would be the, the piece that keeps banks uh the most unsure i do know onboarding into the world of crypto is very easy i can wire money from my bank to something like a coinbase and and have access to crypto within five minutes. Uh, going the other way with large sums of money, I know a lot of people who tell me their banks will not take money the other way. Yeah, Trent, why don't you explain uh, the work that you're doing on blockchain right now? Yeah, so I'm actually a data scientist at a company called Elementus, and we are building a universal blockchain search engine product that sort of helps resolve some of these specific questions around tracing the source of funds, 
to help banks or exchanges or just investment funds, whoever is, is trafficking in these assets to know where it came from, what its risk profile is, where that, whether it's ever touched a sanctioned address. And the idea is that hopefully that will, that will help forward the technology in the ecosystem. It will make it easier for sound regulations to be devised. It will make it easier for compliance, um, for, for banks and institutions to comply with those regulations and just make it all cleaner, I guess, by, by making the criminal activity, by surfacing the criminal activity and, uh, making it more difficult to obfuscate th those things. I think being able to offboard from the crypto landscape back to fiat in an easier manner is going to have profound impacts on crypto itself, though. I have my very skeptical view of the entire crypto ecosystem is that right now it is the fractional reserve system on steroids. We have money coming in from individual speculators as well as VCs. And if you think of it, sort of the base layer is that money was used to uh, build the value of Bitcoin. It was used to build the value of Ethereum and a couple other sort of level one tokens. Then what ends up happening is sort of the next tier of tokens, sort of the projects that get built on top, like the DeFi projects that might have their own governance tokens that are trading. Uh, a lot of times those treasuries for those products are not just funded with fiat, but also funded with other tokens. So as a VC in the crypto space, I might keep all my money in Ethereum and I might say, hey, here's a whole bunch of Ethereum to, to back your project. And that project now has value based on not only the Ethereum in the treasury, but on some sort of speculative future value as to what that project can do. And then that project's tokens can be then used in another treasury. And what happens in my opinion is because there's no real way for this value to ever get burnt out of the system. And for people who, this is on video, so I used air quotes there for quote, <laughs> burnt out. I realize I should probably say that. Uh, because it never really gets destroyed, you just keep you know sort of building value on value on value on value. Now, what do I mean by destroyed? Well, in the traditional economy, let's say I'm a farmer and I borrow some money and I plant some carrots and I take those carrots to the market and you buy them from me for $5. I now have $5 and you have $5 of carrots. In theory, I've created $5. But when you go home and eat those carrots, that value is consumed. We don't have that consumption yet really in the world of crypto. And consumed might be from actually paying taxes Right? The money needs to come out of the crypto world into fiat to pay taxes to government or some other way in which those tokens are burned. But right now, they're really not consumed in any way. And so they can keep being used as collateral. So my very skeptical view of the entire crypto economy right now is that it's sort of this exponential price curve based on this fractional lending on steroids phenomenon that's going on. And until we get a system where you can put your Bitcoin at Bank of America and borrow against it, um, or you can automatically convert it back to fiat and it gets sold, or there's some other consumption mechanism to it, you know, I'm just sort of long a lot of these coins because I'm long this exponential thesis, but it can come crashing down at any moment. So, so is that mostly driven by the fact that people are using it as a speculative vehicle and not as a medium of exchange uh, on the premise that it will just appreciate in value astronomically? It's mostly driven by the fact that it's a speculative vehicle and never really gets destroyed. I guess the 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 one exception, or well not one exception, but the major exception right now is uh, Ethereum, which in sort of this, uh, what do they call it, EIP-1559 change that they implemented, uh, the new model for Ethereum when it runs is that it does burn tokens for when transactions go through. And so you are seeing a lot of Ethereum getting burnt. And so in that sense, uh, it's pseudo deflationary, which might actually have, uh, in, under my thesis, like negative implications as all these other tokens have to reprice uh, as to whether there's sort of enough fundamental backing to their valuation. But I, I guess until like you're just sort of saying token X has a value because someone bought it with token Y and token Y has a value because someone bought it with with token you know Z and token Z is value because I bought it with a dollar. 
and everyone's tracing back to that original dollar. But it was just one dollar that went in the system that gave all these other cryptocurrencies okay. their value. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I, I couldn't figure out why you kept comparing it to fractional reserve, but that makes sense now. I, I see why it would be problematic to have the value just ping ponging into the crypto ecosystem forever and just like imparting ever more value whenever it hits a, a new boundary. But it's not clear to me why consumption is so important. I mean, dollars aren't destroyed either, generally. And, and that's not a huge problem for the, you know, the standard fiduciary ecosystem. So why would it be problematic for Bitcoin to never be destroyed or consumed in some way? So it's a good point that dollars are never really consumed. I guess the gold's idea, not either, you know. Yeah, gold's not either. Um, I guess the idea here is that most of these cryptocurrencies have no fundamental valuation in any way, right? So there's no cash flow or practical use for most of these governance tokens that are being valued at, you know, hundreds of thousands, you know, of dollars. Well, so individually thousands of dollars, but the sort of market cap of these projects is hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. There's there's literally no tie to cash flow to them. So there's no fundamental valuation for the project. I see. So it's purely speculatively driven. And then you have other projects that are being priced on the speculative value of their treasury, which is, again, purely speculatively driven. So you can get this sort of compounding bubble effect. So I, I, I'm running this through the lens in my mind of having seen the Banksy exhibit over the weekend and and how one of his paintings, the girl with the balloon, got destroyed uh, as as it went through the shredder thing. And and then suddenly it became worth way the hell more money as it got <laughs> destroyed. So which doesn't doesn't tie into your thinking at all. But uh, but I'm I'm curious as to now when we look at the total valuation of all the cryptocurrency that's out there right now, it's, it's in the order of over $2 trillion. Now, that has essentially inflated the, the global economy in new and interesting ways that didn't exist in the past. Um, can you talk a little bit about the effect that that's having and um, kind of pros and cons of things like that taking place? Because because somebody effectively can create a new cryptocurrency and create a billion dollars worth of, of crypto out of thin air. And people have. And, yeah. And people have. Yeah. And run off with the money. Yeah. Yeah. So this sort of ties back to the then what can you do with it? Right. So if I create a new cryptocurrency project and I pay myself in the tokens I create, and then I, you know, sort of set a price for those tokens and get a whole bunch of people to buy in and the value of those tokens goes up, can I ever really exit my tokens? Well, yeah, you get these projects that do what are called rug pulls, where the owners basically dump all their liquidity, take out, you know, if there's everyone else was paying Ethereum to buy the governance token, they end up running away with all the Ethereum. But then the question is, what can they do with the Ethereum, right? Uh, and so the answer is, you know, unless you get people exiting the crypto space back to fiat and mass right now there's really not a lot you can do with crypto right you can't you're just starting to be able to in rare cases borrow against it but if i have all my if i have a million dollars in crypto i can't go buy a car with it yet there's very few places that'll accept crypto it's just starting Right. So that like the value of me being worth a lot of money in crypto, unless I start translating it back to fiat, isn't that much. Right. So conversely, like when when you see equity markets really bubble up, uh, you get what would be called the wealth effect. Right. As everyone feels wealthier, there's going to be higher consumption. And this can actually create negative feedback loops in, in the real economy, because as people get more and more invested in the financial economy and markets crash, they can pull back their spending and pulling back their spending hurts future cash flow, which causes share prices to go down further. And so you get this negative feedback loop. In crypto, again, crypto assets could bubble up to 10 trillion and I'm not necessarily sure it changes anything in short order other than maybe sentiment because crypto can't really be used for anything. To go back to, to your 
earlier point, Trent, about, well, dollars don't get burnt either. A lot of what ties a dollar to fundamental value is what it can be used to buy. Right. Right. And a lot of those things that get used to buy get consumed. Right. So there's a, there's a true like consumption value tied to a dollar in some way that again, I don't see existing in current form in crypto markets. And I don't want this to be Corey's bearish on crypto. Like I, again, I, <laughs> That's st- I, think I started out, That's now right? I think I started out saying, I think crypto is going to change the world in many ways. I'm not smart or creative enough to figure out where, what that's going to look like in 10 years. But I think the current, like it's hard to say crypto is at $2 trillion and have it be meaningful. Right. Because it's not a two trillion dollars that's really accepted anywhere for anything. I can I can write on a piece of paper, uh, hey, this is this piece of paper is worth ten trillion dollars, and to me, it's worth ten trillion dollars, right? Yeah. But if you don't accept it, is it really worth ten trillion dollars? Yeah. So so part of like as abstract as money is, ultimately it's tied back to a mental state you can you can achieve or a satisfaction that you can achieve with that because it's a medium of exchange. And I, what I, I think I hear you saying is just that at present, crypto lacks that dimension, which characterizes traditional fiduciary media like dollars. I and, would say that the tying factor with dollars is the fact that the government demands taxes and they demand taxes in dollars. So ultimately a dollar holds value, as, at least as an American, right? I'm not talking from the American perspective. For, as an American, a dollar has value to me because the government is going to demand taxes in dollars. Yeah, and so well, but, they, but they wouldn't if if there weren't a deeper tie into value. Like they wouldn't care if they were just green pieces of paper. It's only because they also, like the bureaucrats and the people running the government, can also achieve things in the real world. There's some tie into, like I said, an actual the satisfaction of a value, or the achievement of but, a goal. Right. So we all agree, right? So money, money comes into existence because I'm a goat farmer and you're a carrot farmer and I want carrots and you don't want goats. How are we going to make this all work? We right. end up with an IOU system. lack of coincidence of wants. Right. And that's why you need a medium. Blah, blah, blah. We end up with money. But why, like the government sets the standard as to which currency based on the currency they tax in. Right. So if the government, if, if you want to all of a sudden start a new currency, right? This happens in South America it's happened several <laughs> times over the last hundred years of they just had to start a new currency. Right. Brazil created the real, uh, probably one of the most recent new currencies, and they gave it the name real just because they wanted people to believe it's real. That's <laughs> that's true. But you start taxing in the real, it forces everyone to move to that currency because that's what they need. Yeah. Right. Again, crypto, no one's taxing in crypto. No one's really buying in crypto. No one's borrowing against crypto. So is it worth anything? I'm curious as to whether or not you think there will be substantive knock on effects as people begin to use it for real things, like as there's a sort of, I guess, value release valve, for lack of a better term, as as it begins to make its way out into lattes that people drink or property that people's buy, people buy or cars that, that they purchase when it starts to look more and more like money, do you think naively, it seems like that would make it a lot more valuable. But given what you've said, no, actually, it might not somehow. I, but, but Well, it might do the converse depending. And, and my view here would be largely that people who have bought into the crypto space right now are, are to, use a, to use a phrase of the times, are, are more diamond hand believers, right? They believe in the value of crypto. If I go to Starbucks and can suddenly spend my Bitcoin to buy a coffee, is Starbucks going to keep that Bitcoin on the balance sheet or are they going to sell it immediately, right? And so the implicit effect is actually, it doesn't really matter that I spent a Bitcoin. What actually happened is I took a Bitcoin, traded it for a dollar, and then used that dollar to buy from Starbucks. Yeah, Starbucks took the Bitcoin from me and they sold it, but it doesn't matter what order the transaction really comes in. So in other words, once we start spending crypto, unless unless all these corporations are willing to create crypto on their balance sheet, because all the spending is really happening in in dollars then it's going to put downward pressure on the price on the price right relative to dollars right so what's what the thing is we always talk about the price this is a numeraire denominator situation where like we're talking about relative to a dollar okay that's really we need to get a little complicated uh (laughs) kind of different well right someone someone could be spending uh crypto to buy Starbucks in Europe, right? Like, I, I guess the point is, the whole point is once you have to go to fiat, let's just use a fiat basket, 
if you're still if unless corporations are willing to hold crypto, the implicit effect is people are selling crypto for fiat to then consume in the real economy. And then I would so maybe maybe if this could still be used as the in, within the digital economy for digital goods and retain its value if those digital goods have value, but if unless real world businesses are going to hold it on their balance sheet, it's it's a downward pressure to convert back to fiat. So so that's some of the significance that has to make cryptocurrency real in your mind at least that sometime in the future we have to be able to use cryptocurrency to buy um, a mortgage on a house or a loan on a car or uh, something on that order to uh, to to make it kind of give it the viability that you think because because I happen I happen to agree that everything's too geeky still and most people don't know how to use it so somehow it's got to come down to um, easy to use on the average person level um, that's probably five to ten years away I don't I don't know for sure, but uh. yeah, I mean, I, I think again, for it to settle at a non bubble nomics value, right? Like a, a truly non speculative value, but a utility value, I think it has to have utility. Uh, right now, most crypto has utility within a very hyper local atmosphere, um, which, by the way, I think can. can retain utility in certain cases. So, so let me tangent this. I'm going to really take a tangent and then bring it back. <laughs> back in the uh, original days of, of massively multiplayer online games, you could play these games and earn digital currency. But they really did not want you taking that digital currency and selling it to other players on some sort of like black market, right? So I go into the game and I spend... 10 hours mining in the deepest dungeons for some rare diamonds or whatever. And I sell it for 10,000 gold pieces. They don't want me then going to eBay and saying, Hey, I'll send, sell 10,000 gold pieces for a hundred dollars or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. One of really interesting use cases that ended up happening though, back in like 2005, 2006 with a game called RuneScape is that there was this huge influx of players who really didn't talk to other players, tried to avoid everyone. And if you talk to them, they said, don't, I don't speak English, please leave me alone. No one knew where they came from, but all of a sudden, like the population of the game doubled. And it turns out, and this was discovered one day because that entire population disappeared overnight, that almost all of these players were from Venezuela. There was actually a blackout that happened in Venezuela and none of these players could play the game anymore. It turns out what these players were doing was they recognized, A, there was a black market for this digital gold, um, and B, that even if they couldn't convert that digital gold into dollars, holding that digital gold was still more stable relative to the dollar than earning money in their local economy which was getting hyperinflated away. <laughs> now, this particular game, RuneScape, was not a cutting-edge AAA title that required super you know, new computer specs. You could play with a really old computer, the types of computers that were available in Venezuela. And so you had all these people saying, my time is better spent playing a game online in this digital world, earning digital gold that I can then convert to fiat, why did that digital gold have value? Because rich countries had players who, for entertainment purposes, were willing to pay that value. Okay, so what does that have to do with crypto? This exact same thing more or less just happened in the Philippines with a play-to-earn game called Axies Infinity. During the COVID crisis, the Philippines shut down, and a lot of people said, how are we going to make money? Well, they started playing this game, Axies Infinity, where they earned Axies token. Axies token is sort of like the in-game you know, currency that's necessary to do anything. Well, if you're a wealthy individual, wealthy from relative standards in a first world country that wants to play this game, you're going to trade fiat for that currency. And that currency is getting harvested by a bunch of people in the Philippines who realize they could make more money playing a video game in the crypto world and sell it to Americans as entertainment value. So you actually have had a whole new ecosystem pop up in the Philippines around this one particular game where they have 
literally incubator schools because it's too expensive to actually start playing the game now where you have like accelerator schools that have kids come in and they basically give them like a loan to get started. And it's in a weird way, it's sort of like subsidizing first world entertainment. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and so, but there's, there's local utility to that token that I think as long as Americans and other rich countries are paying for that entertainment, will retain the value of that token. So there are, I think, weird corner cases where this is this is true. Sorry for that very obscure tangent <laughs> to my history of, of RuneScape well, as was, a child. That was great. That no, was great. No, we, we, we love obscure tangents. Well, uh, this, this episode just is the best illustration of why I no longer do hours and hours of research because I've got all <laughs> these questions about your papers and liquidity cascades and ergodicity and complex systems, and we spent the whole time talking about NFTs and gold in RuneScape. So... Uh, we really, we really appreciate your time. This has been fascinating and thank you so much. My absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Thanks for making it easy for people to, to understand these complex issues. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a rare gift really. Very well, much. I, I appreciate it. I hope, I hope the listeners agree. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Corey.